welcome. This is a topic of great interest to me, uh, not so much aging, but I call it longevity. In fact, several years ago, when my husband and I were living in Chicago, I was having one of my weekly, monthly lunches with two gentlemen who were octogenarians, two of my favorite octogenarians, Abner Mikva and Newton Minow. Uh, Ab was a uh, counselor to the president, a lawyer, a count congressman, a judge. Uh, Newt Minow was one of uh, Kennedy's appointees to the uh, FCC and came up with the great line about television being America's great wasteland. These are brilliant men. Um, and we had our luncheon conversation. We talked about global affairs. We talked about state affairs. We talked about politics in Chicago, which is endlessly interesting. And then Newt turned to me and he said, Kathleen, what are you involved with that pa you're passionate about? I said, I'm on the board of something called the Stanford Center on Longevity. And both Newt and Ab leaned forward and they said, Longevity. Now that's an interesting topic. And to me, that was that sort of sums up when two octogenarians figure out that longevity is interesting, it is. In fact, in less than a century, more years were added to the life expectancy than all the years added across all millennia of human evolution. Long-lived societies, however, have appeared so suddenly that culture, the crucible that holds science and technology, along with wide-scale behavioral practices and social norms, has simply not caught up. So the challenge we face today is converting a world bit built literally by and for the young into a world that supports and engages populations that will live to 100 years and beyond. Fact. An American baby born today has a projected lifespan 20 full years longer than one born in 1925. Fact. For the first time in U.S. history, the number of people over 60 will exceed those under 15. Fact, the population pyramid that our economies are built on with more people at the bottom and a tiny few at the top is morphing into a population rectangle. Most troubling of all, though, to me, is the fact that we fret about ways that older people lack the qualities of younger people rather than trying to figure out how to exploit a growing new resource right in front of our eyes. Author, blogger, activist, Ashton Applewhite has confronted these irrefutable demographic facts, and she's pioneered a national and even global conversation on the topic of longevity. She does it with humor, with energy, and with passion. She challenges us to erase many of the myths and the beliefs about late life, late life and olders, as she likes to call me. As best-selling author Annie Lamott said about her book, this book totally rocks. Wow. Ashley, Ashton Applewhite is a wow. Please join me in welcoming her as she talks about a manifesto against ageism. Ashton. Thank you, Kathleen. Got it. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. So let's get right to the heart of the matter. How does that word make you feel? I used to feel the same way. What was my darkest fear? Ending up in some grim institutional hallway. And then I learned that only 2% Two and a half percent of Americans over 65 end up in nursing homes. In the 10 years I've been working on this, it's dropped from 4%. What else was I worried about? <laughs> Dementia. Alzheimer's is a terrible disease, but it is not typical of aging. 90% of us will think just fine to the end, and dementia rates are falling. Sometimes I say I'm in the both sides of the picture story. It's not that the scary stuff isn't real, it's that that's all we hear. The odds of any one of us getting dementia, the odds are getting lower and lower, and people are being diagnosed at later ages. The real epidemic is anxiety over memory loss. <laughs> 
I also assumed that old people were depressed. I can't tell you how skeptical I was starting out because they were old and they were going to die soon. And it turns out that people are happiest at the beginnings and the ends of their lives. It's called the U-shaped happiness curve, and it has been borne out by dozens of studies around the world. You don't have to be a Buddhist or a billionaire. It is a function. The curve is a function of the way aging itself affects the healthy brain. So I started feeling a lot better about getting older, and I started obsessing about why so few people know these things. The reason is ageism. That's the dictionary definition. We experience it any time someone assumes that we are too old for something, a task, a responsibility, a haircut, instead of finding out who we are and what we're capable of, right? Or too young. Ageism is any judgment on the basis of age, and younger people experience a lot of it too. Nobody's born ageist or prejudiced, but it starts in early childhood. Around the same time, attitudes towards race and gender start to form. And unless we stop to challenge the underlying message that to age is to lose value as a human being, it becomes part of our identity. That's internalized ageism. I had to acknowledge my own prejudices and stop colluding. That's the hard part. I stopped blaming my sore knee, for example, on being 67 because my other knee feels fine and it's just as old. <laughs> Think about it. Think about how often we blame things on age. Sometimes age is relevant. Most of the time, it's not. Discrimination is the problem, right? Come on, baby. I don't know. The slide should advance. Um, well, discrimination is the problem, not aging. It is not being a woman that makes life harder for women, it's sexism. It's not loving a man that makes life harder for gay guys, it's homophobia. And it is not the passage of time that makes getting older so much harder than it has to be. It is ageism. When labels are hard to read, or there's no handrail, or we can't open the damn jar, we think, I should be more limber, I should be better prepared. We blame ourselves instead of blaming the ageism that makes these natural transitions shameful and the discrimination that makes those barriers acceptable. And this discrimination harms us all. From birth to death, everyone experiences it, individually and collectively, in ways that we are just beginning to wake up to. The workplace, there we go. Longer lives obviously require working longer and saving more, and yet two-thirds of Americans report encountering age discrimination. Not one stereotype about older workers is true. Just like race and gender, age is a criterion for diversity, obviously. Age discrimination makes companies less creative and less profitable. I mean, there's tons of studies that show that when you make, you know, leave, cut the older workers out, you reduce profits and productivity, and it is illegal. So it's really nice to see even tech behemoths like Google and Facebook and IBM starting to lose age discrimination lawsuits. Ageism in medicine means less treatment, worse treatment, often no treatment at all. Why should we accept a different standard of care for older people? Right? Let's bring it back to those basic questions. <laughs> that, <laughs> that, right, right? Uh, that's, I have a blog called Yo, Is This Ageist, which is a Q&A blog. So if you see images like that or see something that you wonder whether or not it's ageist, send it in. That's one of my favorites. So there's institutional ageism at work in medicine. Internalized ageism matters to a lot. A growing body of fascinating research shows that people with more positive feelings about aging, that's how they put it. I say people with fact rather than fear-based attitudes towards aging. Walk faster, heal quicker, live longer. Ageism affects cognition too. People who associate old age with growth and purpose, I love this study, are less likely to develop Alzheimer's even if they have the gene that predisposes us to the disease. So think, your attitudes affect your health and your longevity. That's why the World Health Organization, not the World Old People Organization, is developing a global anti-ageism campaign to increase health span along with lifespan. Women face the double whammy of ageism and sexism, so we experience aging differently. There's a double standard at work here, shocker. The notion that aging enhances men and devalues women. 
We women reinforce this standard when we compete to stay young, another punishing, expensive, impossible proposition. These effects add up over time. They're further compounded by race and by class, which is why everywhere in the world, the poorest of the poor and sickest of the sick are old women of color. Feeling alienated from older people and apprehensive at becoming like us is not natural. It is not inevitable. These values are socially constructed, which is just a fancy way of saying we make them up, and we can unmake them. Age segregation cuts us off from most of humanity. An intergenerational world is straight up a better world, I think, you know, for reasons that are obvious to all of us. So as Kathleen alluded to, we have an extraordinary opportunity at this point in human history. For the first time, four and even five living generations are becoming commonplace. And in the Paleolithic era, that was the first time that three living generations became possible. It's called the grandmother hypothesis. For the first time, grandparents came around. That is when art happened. That's when music happened. That's when human civilization flourished. We now have four and even five living generations. So I would submit that that triangle turning into a square that we're supposed to be so panicked about could be an amazing thing, right? The social capital of hundreds of millions more healthy, well-educated adults than ever before in human history. So how do we tap into that and shape a world that supports people of all ages across the lifespan, right? Because younger people need support too. I mean, I like, I like the phrase, a, phrase age equity. So how do we make that happen? Start by tapping into what we know. Growing older isn't just different from what we've been brainwashed to believe. It's way better. It's not, again, that the losses aren't real, but aging brings confidence and perspective and self-awareness. That's why I have never met anyone who wants to go back to their youth. No, you can't just swap out like the battered bits. Because everyone knows that our years are what make us us. Look more generously at each other and ourselves. Entire industries are built on convincing you that my 67-year-old face and body are hideous. A system designed to exploit our insecurities can only do it if we agree to it. Instead of muttering what the hell happened at the face in the mirror, which we all do, I do it too, how about taking a minute to recall some of the stuff that did happen and how remarkable it was, right? Let's not delude ourselves. This is the work of a lifetime. We need to embark on it with others, especially we women and with people of all ages, but none of this stigma is natural and none of it is fixed. We can insist on being seen and valued as our full, rich, lumpy, complicated selves and taking that out into the world. It's hard, but we can do it. Ask for help. You know, my, the most important chapter in my book is probably, it's the independence trap. It's about this, I would like to take the word independent out of the entire aging discourse. No one is independent ever. I love this quote from a Dutch gerontologist, autonomy requires collaborators. No one is ever independent. We're social creatures. All of life is interdependence. We ask for help. We love giving help. These are two-way transactions. Let's acknowledge the need for helping hands across our entire lives and reach for them gratefully and without shame. Make friends of all ages. If you don't know people much older or younger than you, seek them out. And uh, easier said than done, but think of something you like to do. You can't just like grab a young person and say, hi, let's be friends but find a mixed age group to do it with, right? And try not to stay home just because you'll stick out because that is how desegregation happens. People stop conforming and incremental social change takes place. And it's great for younger people too because otherwise each generation has to figure out on its own just how dumb and destructive it is to fear getting older and how much of our youth we squander on worrying about it, right? Join forces. Dismantling ageism will take nothing less than a mass movement, like the 20th century movement that catalyzed a mass shift of consciousness for women around the world. And what happened was women came together and shared their stories and realized that what they'd been thinking of as personal problems were actually widely shared political problems. That's consciousness raising, right? And that shift in consciousness is the linchpin 
of movement building. And on my website, thischairrocks.com, you can download a free uh, guide to starting a consciousness raising group around age bias called Who Me? Ageist? Because, of course, that's where it starts, looking at our own bias. But that's the uncomfortable part. Once you see it in yourself, you see it in the world around you, and you realize, oh, we can come together and do something about this. So changing the culture is a tall order, I know that. But look at gender. Think how recently we used to think of it, most of us, as a binary, male or female. And now we understand it's a spectrum. You know, it, it, obviously, age is a spectrum. There is no male-female binary. There's no old-young binary. And that imaginary threshold segregates us and fills us with needless dread. Until we put a stop to it, ageism will continue to oppress us all. Why add another ism to the list when so many? Racism, in particular, call out for action. Here's the thing. We don't have to choose. When we make the world a better place to grow old in, we make it a better place in which to be a woman, to have a disability, to be queer, to be non-white, to be non-rich. And when we show up at all ages for whatever cause matters the most to it, and I'm, I know so many of you are active in so many you know, uh, community organizations, when we show up at all ages, for whatever that is, we make that effort more effective, for obvious reasons, if there's all ages, and we dismantle ageism in the process simply by showing up in a mixed age group. Longevity is here to stay. A movement to end ageism is underway. I'm in it, and I hope you will join me. Thank you. Yay. That was great. Thank you. Thank you, oh, Ashton. You're welcome. Now, in reading your book, you tell us a little bit how you came to this topic. Um, let's talk about you. You grew up in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and uh, how did you end up in the Natural History Museum? And then how did you end up oh, with boy. this topic, this book? What was your path um, writing? I have backed into everything in my life. There has never been a plan of any sort. Um, I uh, moved to New York when uh, my money traveling ran out. I, I fled the country after college, um, traveled till my money ran out. The dollar was strong then. I could go for a year and a half. Moved to New York because that's where you seek your fortune. Mm -hmm. Worked in publishing because I, I, I swear this was my career plan. I like to read, they'll pay me to read. Mm -hmm. um, wrote a little book that became the best-selling paperback of 1985. Topic um, titled? Titled, Truly Tasteless Jokes. Oh. <laughs> There's I, one. We I was a clue on Jeopardy. The, oh, good. Super proud of that. Yeah. Um, did you think about ages and then? Oh, my God, no. No, I didn't. What did you I, think of old people? I, 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 pr I probably didn't think about it at all. Yeah. And if I, I mean, if you had told me that I would become obsessed with aging, I would say, why would I want to think about something so yucky and yeah. depressing? Yeah. And it is anything but, but I had to, you know, what, back, back my way into it. I mean, I had no idea. I ended up, um, I married at 29, and, and uh, I think the fact that I was 29, this is mortifying, but was a big reason I got married. I realized <laughs> after 11 years I couldn't stay married. Um, my attorney said, you know, more and more of my clients are women, like you. And I went home and found in two seconds that two-thirds of divorces are initiated by women. Uh -huh. Very common fact, easy to find. I was bowled over. Mm -hmm. I thought it was it must be 98%, you know, men dumping their sad old wives for cute young trophy wives. And that was the catalyst for uh, my first serious book, which is called Cutting Loose, Why Women Who End Their Marriages Do So Well. You know, why don't more women know this? Is marriage more, you know, worse? Is life after marriage better? Um, I got the job at the Museum of Natural History um, as a writer, I, and it was a fantastic job. As usual, I, I, I never took a science course. Mm -hmm. I had no, I didn't know anything about aging. I have no degrees. I am a generalist, which is what makes this mm -hmm. subject so interesting. I was in my mid-50s. I was afraid of getting old. And what were you? What were you doing at the Natural History? I was a, just, I was a staff writer. Staff I writer. I worked with scientists and teachers to do um, materials for mostly for teachers, yep. but also the general public. Right. So I got this incredible science yeah. education. Yeah. Um, Did you learn anything about the way the animal kingdom treats old older animals? 
Uh, I think it. I think it's highly species dependent. Species dependent. How about that? There you go. Yeah, there that, you go. That is true. Good. Okay. Um, and I started. I so I, I was afraid of getting old, mm -hmm. and I'm sort. I'm. I'm. I don't have a cute story about my beloved grandmother or experiencing age discrimination um, in the workplace, but. Uh, I just started learning about longevity, and in, I swear to God, the first few weeks came up with those facts that I still start my talk with. And once again, I became obsessed with why people don't know these things, because mm -hmm. they are not hard to find. Right. And the short answer is that we don't know those things about how well women can do outside of marriage. It's not an anti-marriage book, or it's certainly not an anti-man book. It's an anti-patriarchy book. Mm -hmm. We live in a sexist, patriarchal, capitalist culture in which if everyone stays in their little boxes, it's better for the, you know, the powers that be. We don't know these things about aging because we live in an ageist, sexist, mm -hmm. misogynist culture, and because people profit from our insecurities. They make money off it, and because... Was it different? I mean, looking back in, in history, we, there was reverence for our elders. Uh, we, we lived in uh, families with exactly. multi-generations. We lived in mixed-age communities. Mixed-age communities. Yeah. And most of us did not live as long, although this portrayal of, you know, this mass of older people as necessarily a bad thing, there's actually no evidence, very little evidence, that shows that an aging population is bad for the economy. Japan... Korea, um, Germany, where that which have the uh, the highest rates of old people, also ha they have very healthy economies. You know, they have more automation. Is that good or bad? We don't know yet. But I think it's why it's incredibly important that we look at population, try and look at it through a neutral lens, try and wipe the slate, wipe this automatic assumption of, oh, fear, terror, disaster away, look at it neutrally, and tap into it. Well, look at the numbers follow the money, if you say we're, you describe our capitalist society, is it going to change with what's described as the silver tsunami, the new economy? Yeah. Um, how do you see the, that uh, impacting? Well, it's not a tsunami. It's the best studied demographic phenomenon in history. Right? They've known that all we baby boomers were going to grow up and then probably get old. Mm -hmm. So even that framing, that alarmist rhetoric, it's like you know the red peril. Or Instead the of the Calvary is coming. Well, have, I mean, a friend of mine calls it the, the uh, social uh, si silver reservoir. Mm -hmm. You know, language matters. Mm -hmm. That is a deficit accounting. It doesn't account for all the hundreds and hundreds of ways in which older people contribute to the economy mm -hmm. in ways that are harder to measure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if we... And also, there, there are labor shortages. I mean, it's kind of crazy that they, that the ageism is so fierce that they don't even try and sell us stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and the mixed-age workforce is more productive. I do think that economic forces are going to going to force good change in those arenas. I think the harder change is, frankly, between our own ears. Between our own yeah. ears, yeah. You talk about... Um, the independence trap. You mm -hmm. mentioned that in your talk. And I love the way you describe um, long life is a team sport. Mm -hmm. Talk some more about I, that. That Not my line. A line, um, uh, Bill Thomas, who wrote, have, have, did you all read what's Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal? He's the guy with the parakeets, who let all the parakeets loose in the nursing home. Wonderful, wonderful man. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I knew nothing starting out. I assumed the most important component of a good old age would be health. Not so. Then I thought, well, it must be wealth. Mm -hmm. It is having a solid social network, which is one of the reasons, obviously, that having, you know, making and keeping friends of all ages is so important. Mm -hmm. So um, build that network, cast a wide net, and that is that maps absolutely to a better quality of life. Mm -hmm. It compensates for a lot of other mm -hmm. shortcomings, although it's great to be healthy and rich, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a plus. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, one of the, the Stanford Center on Longevity, which I mentioned in my introduction of you and that we talked about, one of the first facts that they talked about was volunteerism was the most important public health benefit hmm. uh, after the cessation of smoking. And you go, how can that be true? Yeah, and the reason is that 
when you volunteer for something, you're engaged, you're involved with other people, you're connected, you're not... And you feel a sense of purpose. And you feel a sense of purpose, and that created these positive health benefits like, yeah, it's like, almost like a that, that are as important to, to a longer life as other good health habits. One thing, I, a study I came across early on, and I, I mean, I was so skeptical. They have a, I think it's L Laguna Beach maybe, long-term longitudinal study of a big group of people, so yeah. blue chip science. And they um, autopsy people and found that some of the people who were completely sharp to the end had brains full of plaques and tangles, typical of Alzheimer's. So they looked at what those people had in common, and it was a sense of purpose. So two points here. Purpose can be writ really small. You don't have to want to cure cancer or start an incredible festival like this. You can want to see your grandchild, you know, graduate from middle school or be, I mean, my, my partner is, he's besotted with his oldest granddaughter, so he flew down to LA to see her compete in gymnastics, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, it, you don't, you know, I, I think we, the people, the older people doing amazing things and in incredible health are fantastic, but they are outliers. Mm -hmm. They typically have economic advantages not, that not everyone does. So it's important to say, look, my purpose can be, can be modest, can be mm -hmm. small. And, of course, to look at the biggest obstacle to having a purpose in late life is a culture that tells us that getting older means shutting up and shuffling off stage. Mm -hmm. That's why this movement is so important. Now, you talk about um, become an old person in training. So how can I tell my, <laughs> my granddaughters and, and grandsons, what, what do I advise them about how to become an old person <laughs> in training? What does that mean? I mean, I think, it's really, I think it's really hard to imagine getting old when you're young. And I don't think that's prejudice. I think it's, just, it's a long way off, right? You can, I mean, when I was seven and grown up just sat in chairs all the time, I'm like, wait, why are you possibly sitting when you could run, right? Mm -hmm. And that, by the way, the phrase old person in training, um, I got uh, stole with attribution from, from a geriatrician named Joanne Lynn. Early on, I'm, I had no idea how important it would become, but I'm like, oh, that's actually what I am, even if I don't know what it means. All prejudice relies in othering, seeing a group as other mm -hmm. than ourselves, other race, other sports team. The weird thing about aging is that that other is our own future older selves. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a form of self-loathing. It is distancing from our own, the fact that we will get older, even though, of course, we know we will. So becoming an old person in training is simply an imaginative trick, mm -hmm. or not quite a trick, but, you know, a, a choice. Mm -hmm. The earlier in life we can do that, the better, because then you don't get sucked into this hamster wheel of denial. And you know, when you're young, that the older you can be a distant speck on the horizon because it's really hard to see her. Mm -hmm. But if you acknowledge that you will become her, then you don't get stuck in this othering trap. When you are around older people, you mm -hmm. look and see, you know, at them, at us, instead of through us and past us, and go, oh, I really like, I wonder why that woman didn't wear earrings today. When right. I'm her age, I'm going to wear earrings. Or, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. whatever the thing is, behaviors that you emulate, or behaviors that you hope to not emulate, mm -hmm. and then you don't get stuck in the age denial, in which is really the, the heart of the problem, because mm -hmm. that's where ageism sinks its claws into us. And what has surprised you the most? Everything. As you, as you, I mean, this, this topic, as you said, is endlessly interesting, but are there, are there things that particularly um, jump out at you as, as most of Is there an aha? There's, there's or so, are there, there many ahas? There's so many ahas. I mean, sometimes, you know, ageism is still so unexamined that I, I compare it sometimes to cleaning a really dirty window, okay? It's a really dirty window, but you can see where you've been. And because it's unexamined, I think that, you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. everyone, you know, these are new ideas to people, mm -hmm. and that's sort of fun. Um, it's a lot of fun uh, because... Um, because, I mean, for example, you know, ask people what they think of as criteria for diversity. Most people don't add age yet, mm -hmm. but when I say, how about age, no one says that's a dumb idea. Right. Right? They smack their head and go, why didn't I think of that? So the, the ground is plowed, I think, mm -hmm. for this much more than it still is for, f uh, you know, racial equal opportunity. And even, you know, 50 years ago to say a woman could 
run this company, fly this plane, as well as a man, I think that was a big imaginative leap. And I think the culture is much more ready intuitively, politically, spiritually to say, gee, why should the fact that I'm over 50 or 60 or whatever sideline me? That's yeah. not, if we don't want to be discriminated against on the basis of our skin color or who we sleep with, why should I ex accept being discriminated against because of the year in which I was born? Yeah. So you have a blog. It's uh, you ca it's called Yo Is This Ageist? Yeah. What are some of the <laughs> responses you've gotten to that? Uh, well, I should say I have a, a, a blog where I've been thinking out loud, which is thischairrocks.com slash blog. So if you, if you don't want to buy my book, which I'm sure you all are dying to do. And she and, will be signing and I will right be signing. after. It's fun to read. Say it's fun to read. Yeah, it's, oh, it, it is fun. In fact, <laughs> a year before this conference, I got a email or text from a, one of my close friends in Washington, D.C., who said... I am interviewing this incredible woman who wrote this book called This Chair Rocks. It's coming to you in the mail. So, Jamie, before you sent me this book, before you asked me to do this, I had received this book, um, and it well, is fun to lucky read. Lucky me. And it is, it is full of, of great bits of advice. But talk some more about the, the yo, is this ageist. So that's my regular blog where I've been thinking is is all this, you know, tons of ideas and stuff for free, also resources. Um, and oldschool.info is a clearinghouse of free, vetted uh, anti-ageism resources from all around the world, not just my stuff. So check that out. Yo, is this ageist? I modeled on this blog called Yo, is this racist? Where this the guy is just merciless. I try to be slightly more merciful. Yeah. He started it because we're uncomfortable talking about race. I started Yo Is This Ageist because we often don't know whether something is or isn't ageist. Mm -hmm. A good uh, sort of litmus test is if a similar comment on the basis of race or sex, you know, would you give someone a birthday card that you know mocks cruelly mocks? Mm -hmm. who they sleep with, you know, well then, what makes it okay on the basis of age? Um, so I did it because we don't know what, mm -hmm. often what ageism consists of, so you can, you know, ask a question. I mean, what, um, God, I haven't even had the nerve to post this one. Someone sent me a picture of, like, a Tweety Bird at 403 or something, like a really wrinkled, grotesque Tweety Bird. Mm -hmm. So go to Yoel, post it when I have the stomach for it. Someone just wrote in... Um, is it ages to call old people sweetie or tell them they're cute? To which I said, well, not if they're your sweetie and you think they're cute, but otherwise, don't do it. Right. You know, so. What about young lady? Don't love young lady. Don't love uh, young lady? Don't love young lady. Uh, I mean, a really good, uh, I only have one good snappy answer in all this thinking, which is in the answer to someone. When someone says, you look good for your age, say, you look good for your age, too. That one I like. <laughs> and let that uncomfortable silence, you know, sit there. It's, mm -hmm. it's important not to, be, not to be snarky and gotcha, but a really good all-purpose answer when someone says something really ageist and you really want that snappy answer is, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, when you call me young lady, wh what do you mean? Because we need to force, social change is uncomfortable. Yeah. You know, it's, it takes a little, you know, nerve to, to, con to throw that back at the person, which is why you don't want to be hostile or gotcha, but you want to say, what, what do you mean? And then the person has to think, well, what, right. what did I mean? And that's how social change happens. Yeah. One of the other topics you cover in your book, um, you talk about the bull looks different. <laughs> yeah. Kind of along, you know, the same yeah. lines about what did you mean? What it, talk about the bull look, looks different. Um, Th well, this uh, there are lots of good lines in the book that I came up with, but I'm also s very scrupulous to give um, credit where credit is due. I went on a journalism fellowship to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, and we sat we ha had a class with a bioethicist named Tom Finucane, who said that his mantra was a Mexican saying that the appearance of the bull changes when you enter the ring. Right? Mm -hmm. Looks different to the matador, <laughs> <laughs> and I shortened it to the bull looks different. Psychologists call it the psychologist's fallacy. We can never know what another person is experiencing. It. And in a culture that barrages us with negative messages about yeah. aging, about disability, we project our fears. 
and we assume that the quality of life of someone, you know, the proverbial little old lady hobbling across the street, you mm -hmm. know, I, I too, I would like put me out of my misery if I get like that. Now I know two things, that it's incredibly presumptuous of me to assume I know what's going on in her life and her, I mean, she's, you know, off going for a hot rendezvous with her boyfriend. We don't know, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and that... Um, We're going to get to sex in a minute and because the, that's and, a big topic, right? <laughs> that the, her quality of life is probably much, much higher than we assume because we continue to do, I mean, this is, pr tell me if you disagree, please, but we continue to do the things we love that are most important to us mm -hmm. in life, even if we can't do all of them in the way that we used to do them, and there are real losses, again, but there are also ways in which it's better, sex. Yeah. It's a perfect example. So, reading the paper several months ago, I was astonished to read a, a clip that the fastest growing number of STD was in individuals over 65. <laughs> so, I was dying to ask you <laughs> all about that because you talk about sex in of your book. I do. That's another reason to of buy this I book. Do. So, so talk about that. Well, and that's one ageism. reason. STDs are higher is because uh, doctors don't ask older people about their sex lives because of the presumption that, you know, once you're not, you know, young and, you know, why, why, I mean, why would we stop having sex if it's important to us? Doctors don't ask and we don't press the point, you know, the burden is on us as well. Um, you also can't get pregnant, so there's a, an assumption that, you know, prevention, you don't need condoms for that. Well, guess what? We do. And there, there are ways in which our bodies are even more vulnerable to transmission of diseases, as some, some STDs, as we age. So it is really a function of Puritanism mm -hmm. and sexism. Um, you know, I, 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 it is, for lots of people, I mean, libido does diminish, and it is totally fine to, you know, not have to, to you know, that that's being sexually active is... If it's not important to you anymore, that's fine too, right? There is no right way to age. Mm -hmm. um, but I like to point out that if you think of your, if, if for the sake of the argument that we're talking about being sexually active as a goal, look at your friends who are. They are not the thinnest. They are not the prettiest. They're not the youngest. They are the people who know their lovers are lucky, who have beaten back this ugly and deeply sexist message that to age is to become ugly that to age is to fail so one of the best things we i mean we have a lot to learn from the body acceptance mm -hmm. movement right learn to i mean when i was 14 i thought the fact that my thighs rubbed together was the worst thing in the world mm -hmm. i'm over it you know <laughs> it's like a long time ago and that's it's liberating getting older i think especially yeah. tell me if i'm speaking for you but you know to be an older woman and to be more freed up from how people are judging how we look that's a huge freedom free at last yeah free and at if last you can, <laughs> if you can take that if it's your choice there's yeah. no one right way to do this yeah. you know it's fine to put that energy elsewhere yeah Right, but if you can take that knowledge out into the world, that's a powerful thing. I want to cover all these topics. We've done we've done a lot. Death, got to get from sex to death. This Why not? this this program <coughs> is better than than any of the others. I think you talk about bringing death out of the closet yeah. too, because it's inevitable. It's the one thing we can count on, along with taxes. And um, how do you? talk about it in the book? I mean, how do you say we should address this? There are tons of people who write about death in particular. Mm -hmm. And one, I mean, I, it's, it's a paradox to me that I think as a culture, we're getting better at talking about dying before we get better at talking about aging. So I see this conversation that I hope to engender as paving the way. Because surely, if we don't talk about the fact that we're getting older, we're less likely mm -hmm. to talk about being mortal. I do think that the conflation of aging and dying, like bookstore shelves where you mm -hmm. see aging and dying, that is a function of ageism in society. We are aging from the minute we're born. It is not just something annoying old people do. Mm -hmm. And dying is a discrete biological event that happens at the end of all this living. 
the best way to have the death, we hope, is to talk about it and to talk about it on an ongoing basis. That's back to the autonomy requires collaborators. We're all gonna need help with more stuff and should we become incapacitated at the end, who, who are you going to talk to in advance about what we think we'll want? The bull looks different. I used to be super smug. I was like, I have all my papers signed. And then I, and I had to talk with my kids. And my son said, well, mom, what if you're hit by a cab tomorrow? And I was like, I want that liver transplant. And he said, well, that would be an extreme intervention. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, right. You know, I want that liver today. Maybe I'll want it when I'm 103. I don't know. But the best way I can help my friends and family give me the death I think I want is to talk about it on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. So I really, and to talk about all the stuff yeah. along the way, which is talking about getting older, the scary stuff and the fact that our fears are so out of proportion and that fear is bad yeah. for us. So in the two minutes that we have left, three minutes that we have left, tell us what an age-friendly world looks like, would look like to you. Oh boy. Um, well, there's the, the book ends with a whole list of, of policy suggestions, economic suggestions. I would, um, I would say the most important component of it is that all our spaces become intergenerational. Mm -hmm. And there is tremendous uh, um, impetus in society all over the place that the anti-ageism movement had nothing to do with, which is great, about intergenerational housing, about making universities more all age friendly, more you know friendly to continuing ed students or what it, what do they call us lifelong learning? Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, to uh, workforce, obviously, you know the workforce is going to have to learn to incorporate four and five generations, and th there are challenges to that. Making um, making uh, public spaces all age friendly. The World Health Organization has an age friendly cities initiative. I like to say that's all age friendly because the same things that make a community great to grow old in, public transportation, green spaces, social services, mm -hmm. are the same things that make it great to be a commuter in, mm -hmm. to have a family in. So it's really resist. Anytime something is framed as old versus young, it's a bogus mm -hmm. distraction, mm -hmm. right? Because we're all going to get old and the same things that, same in the workforce, you know, younger people at the mercy of a gig economy, not get, being able to save for retirement, we're getting caught up in those same global processes. Don't fall for old versus young framing. We want a world of age equity or otherwise these solutions won't be sustainable. That is terrific. So as we think about the 100 year life, we need to focus on ensuring that as young as we are, we prepare ourselves to be mentally sharp and physically fit and financially secure. By looking at our own By bias. looking at our own biases. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Ashley. Thank you, Kathleen.